if you could burn thorium and uranium and do it at prices competitive with coal, you could deliver U.S. levels of power consumption to everyone on the planet for a thousand years. Just think how you'd think differently about the world if you could deliver U.S. levels of power consumption to everyone on the planet for a thousand years. And, and that's possible in these technologies, though unproven. And that's what got me so interested in it, because it cuts through the Gorgon knot of two billion people out of poverty and containing the environmental impact, if in fact you can solve it. So now I want to talk to you as the John Heinz Professor of Management Practice and Environmental Management, the world's longest job title. Uh, and I want to talk to you about the, the problems of nuclear energy and about having to think about nuclear energy again as one of the tools in mankind's kit of trade uh, in dealing with how do you get two billion people or so out of poverty and how do you contain the environmental impact of that move. Uh, with us today, out of the goodness of his heart, is Ray Rothrock. <laughs> uh, Ray's uh, venture capitalist of, of, of repute, was uh, one of the primary players at Venrock in the Valley for, for years. Ray has the unique distinction of not only being a Harvard MBA class of 80, 88, uh, but also has, uh, is a nuclear engineering trained MBA from, from Texas A&M and from MIT. And it's one of the few of our tribe that uh, has actually worked in the field and run a reactor and done all those things. So we're not going to invest in anything that requires subsidies because subsidies often go away. We're going to invest in things that can scale because scale will win. And you have to keep in mind that whatever technologies you invest in, you're competing in a commodity market. Electricity is commodities, oil is commodity, sunlight's a commodity. So uh, in, in normal venture capital investments, look for big spreads, right? So I can have high pricing and have big margins and all that. That was not true in energy, and I think a lot of people got their head handed to them. But I had a fun time uh, in my career. One of the things I want to point out in some of Joe's graphs, we have 100 plants in the United States. I think it's maybe 99 now. They're going to go away in 25 years. That's the largest significant contribution to CO2 is the loss of those nuclear plants in the United States, in the world. Innovations are in hand. We have, this, this country has a history uh, with 50 different reactor designs. Joe alluded to one. There are 50 of them out there. These things were tested, run, shut down. Back in the 50s, an admiral named Rick Hover made a decision to build submarines run by power plants based on uranium, and he picked water, and that pushed everything towards water. And for the longest time, back actually the 40s and the 50s, uranium water-cooled plants was what it was all about. And so the whole system sort of focused on that. It was a great decision, a, a, a powerful decision, but it left a lot of good ideas in the dust, which is where we are today. Entrepreneurs are willing and able. So universities are full of grad students. I am stunned. When I was a nuclear engineer back in the early 70s, Texas A&M, there were 50, I had graduated with 53 guys. Texas A&M today has 500 students in their nuclear engineering department. Why? It's all about climate change. I've been down there, I've talked to these students. They, you know, they, they don't necessarily stick to nuclear, but they get the, the understanding, the principles and so forth. But a lot of them are going overseas, India and China as a matter of fact. But the universities are full of grad students interested in this. Again, climate change is a big driver. Well, is risk capital willing and able? Well, it turns out it is. Uh, I did a little study with some guys in Washington. There's presently over a billion private dollars invested in nuclear energy in this country today, in North America, in North America today. A billion dollars. I, didn't, I, didn't, had, I had no idea it was that much money. I've got a list here in a minute. And then sponsorship. Well, the financial sponsorship is quite limited. The regulatory sponsorship, you would say, well, that's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and it's a, well, it's a problem. Uh, and utilities, they're hungry for power. Low, cheap, clean power. There's mandates to make it clean. And of course, they're in the commodity market, so low cost wins. That's what you gotta have. So the path to success is, is, is it clear? Is it risk adjusted? Not in the United States. As Joe alluded, in China, they sort of push some democratic uh, elements out of the way to do their nuclear program. So we concluded at Venrock in the 2000s that nuclear was ripe for disruption. And just, I was slightly biased being a nuclear guy, but let me, uh, let me just assure you that I'm not just only nuclear. I have 23 kilowatts of solar on my house. I made the investment. 
my electric bill went to zero. Uh, this is where it started. So I, I, the Blue Ribbon Commission was fun because I learned a lot about where our country was in nuclear. The movie addressed the issues on the table. And so some, coming out of the movie, a bunch of us got together at my house in March of 2013. Joe Skyped in for that meeting. And we assembled this group called Nuclear Reimagined. And we said, okay, well, let's figure out what's going on. Clearly, we got to get the NRC involved. Clearly, we got to get the Hill involved. So some of these names you may know, but we came to Washington uh, twice. On the second trip, we were received with open arms. Unbelievable. Just unbelievable. And in fact, two weeks from Monday, the White House is convening a private session on nuclear energy. Uh, me and many other people are involved, about 35 of us. But it was, so if you go back to 2010, it's been a five-year effort. If you go to 2013, which is kind of when we organized ourselves, it's been a two-year effort. So in two years, we've gotten the White House, including the president, to acknowledge that nuclear is there. We've gotten the DOE to put nuclear into the nation's energy plants, which weren't there beforehand, believe it or not. Nuclear wasn't even discussed in what this thing's called the QER, the Quadrennial Energy Review. We've got industry players who are interested. I've talked to, I don't know, half a dozen nuclear utility CEOs from uh, John Rowe to Tom Fanning to Tom, uh, Tony Early and others. They're interested as customers, so it seems like everything's coming together. The one thing that's holding us back is the NRC. And uh, the NRC is not capable of licensing things. I could spend 30 minutes on why the NRC is not capable of licensing things outside of water. But Chairman Burns, who's the president, uh, the current chairman of the NRC, is personally engaged. It's on his agenda, and we are working with him to come up with new regulatory framework. If you go to the NRC and you want to build a power plant, they will tell you that your reactor building has to be 13 feet thick and have this kind of capacity and stuff. Why? It doesn't make sense if you've got an atmospheric pressure power plant rather than a 2,500 PSI power plant. It doesn't make any sense, but yet that's the way the regs are written. So we have to undo that in order to do it right. Uh, if you take the, uh, the EIA's numbers, uh, and again, I think you'd find very uh, little difference and compare the 2010 actual with the 2040 forecast by country, by source of energy. Uh, and again, this is all kinds of energy. Uh, you see the United States is primarily forecasted to build its economy around increasing uses of natural gas. That comes directly from the innovations in drilling and in uh, production associated with shale gas and tight oil in North America. And that's been a remarkable uh, uh, and unexpected innovation. It says in China, uh, there are gonna be many forms of energy developed, but by far the largest component of that is coal. And by the way, that's, there's, there's even more coal being, being, being used there because there are actually old plants being shut down and new plant coal plants going into production, which are more efficient. So it actually understates the amount of physical building activity you would think that's there, because there's a lot of replacement activity. Uh, people talk about solar's really important in China, wind is really important in China, uh, and, and the answer is no, it's not. Uh, by the way, the country that has the best understanding of the costs of building solar and the cost of building wind are India and China. And these are their forecasts. These are econometric forecasts that are then tuned by looking at actually approvals, licensed approvals uh, for sites. So these are no longer simply computer projections. They're computer projections that people have adapted by saying, have in fact you handed out this, this many permits in these time frames in any event. In Europe, the energy mix is much more spread though so there's a tremendous belief that there will be a lot of wind, primarily in Germany, primarily coming out of the North Sea, brought into the economy. So, so each piece of the world, based on its alternatives, its weather, its physics is making decisions. But there's one thing I don't want you to miss. The scale here ends at 300. The scale here ends at 600. And the scale here ends at 1200. China is massively more important than anything else. To some extent, it shows the growth of China 
a mixed economy in the United States. And the European energy picture is one where nearly all energy intensive activity leaves Europe for China or the United States. Uh, I personally don't know how you handle the employment uh, problems that that leaves. I mean, surely everybody in Europe doesn't want to be a museum guide or a hotel operator. If you compare India and China, you see that China is essentially making the same kind of trade-offs that India is making. Essentially, a coal-intensive economy with, with, at least by statements of the Modi government, indicating that that will be emphasized even more in the future. The thing I think is important about, though, this tells us the stated intention of nations. This is what we intend to do. If you look at the current forecast of approved nuclear plants, the great bulk of these are in China and in India and in Russia. The rest of the world is basically neutral in that. And again, rich countries can do what they want to do. You can see what the Chinese and Indians are doing, and they're poor countries. They do what they have to do. They're building coal plants. There are three designs being pursued today. Uh, there are these uh, Westinghouse AP1000 variants. They're other than these, but it's the dominant one. Light water reactors, uh, generation three plus systems, again, with these passive safety systems. They shut themselves down if they get too hot. Uh, a group of systems which are, instead of using light water, use sodium as the coolant, sodium fast reactors. And TerraPower, the one that I found myself an investor in, is a sodium fast reactor. Uh, they are rumored to be building their first prototype in China. Uh, that they've never issued a press release themselves about that. I've been quoted about that, saying I do not know what they are doing. But I think it's generally believed that's what they are doing. And they made the decision to move to China and go through licensing in China because they saw no way to move through licensing in the United States. So just as very often drugs are developed in this country, but brought to market to an agency in some other part of the world, they did this with nuclear reactors, with their reactor, because of their belief about the unlicensability of anything but a light water reactor in America. Again, the thing that makes this question pressing is that unless you give the Chinese and Indians all, an, all, a clearly perceived alternative to coal, that means cheap enough and scalable enough, probably by mid-20s, the plants, mid-20s, the plants will have already been built. The carbon will be in the air, and it will be too late. And can I add to that? It's a 50 to 100 year decision. So that plant's built and it's gonna run for 100 years. So it's, that's what makes urgency important. My fear is that people will be people, and so you need a technical miracle. And by the way, I think we'll see other miracles. This is the only one I know you can deliver on, uh, in my opinion. Thank you all very Thank much, you very we much. appreciate it.